Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this, the um, sixth meeting of 2016 of the Public Petitions Committee and the final meeting of this session. Can I remind all present, including members, that mobile phones and blackberries, etc., should be turned off as they can interfere with the sound system. Um, before going to our formal agenda, I would just like to bring the committee's uh, attention to an issue in relation to Petition 1593, which we have been considering over a period of time from Fans Against Criminalisation. A complaint was made under the terms of the Code of Conduct, Section 7.3, Volume 2 of the Code, uh, details the requirements in relation to members' conduct during a committee meeting. This section of the Code cross-refers to Rules 7.3.1 and 7.3.2 of Standing Orders, Section 9.1.6A of Volume 2 of the Code provides that complaints about the conduct of a member of a committee are to be referred to the convener of the committee. Upon receiving that complaint, I thought it was only fair to afford the member complained about the opportunity to respond to the terms of that complaint. I therefore extended this opportunity to Kenny McCaskill, as he was the person who had been complained about, but at no point made any comment about the substance of that complaint. This simply fulfils the responsibilities that come with the role of convener under the Code of Conduct, responsibilities that are determined by the Parliament and with which I must and have acted in accordance. I provided clarification to Kenny McCaskill of the basis on which the complaint failed to me to consider in that role and advised of how to go about seeking clarification from the standards clerk should he so wish. It appears to be that Mr McCaskill conflated an invitation to provide comments with a finding on the terms of the complaint and he responded with comments that challenged both my authority as the, com the committee convener and attacked me personally. I therefore asked him to withdraw his comments about my conduct and to apologise for them and to respond to the complaint. He has done neither. <clears throat> On November 21, 2012, um, I made comments in the Chamber uh, of the Parliament, in response to which the presiding officer said, the standing orders of this Parliament explicitly state that members shall respect the authority of the presiding officer. It is inevitable that decisions of the Chair will not meet the approval of all members at all times. That has always been the case. Nevertheless, it is imperative that the authority of the Chair is respected at all times. I acknowledge that Mr McMahon apologised. As, as presiding officer, I will support to the limits of my powers the conduct of parliamentary business in this chamber. I will, however, not tolerate behaviour that falls short of the standards that the people of whom we are privileged to represent expect of us. The PO did this uh, and found uh, the standing orders in the Code of Conduct, ha but I have found that the, the Code of Conduct and the standing orders have offered me no such protection whatsoever in respect of the deliberate contempt with, with which Mr McCaskill has shown towards me and, more importantly, the petitioner and the third sector body who also complained about his comments. I just wanted to put that on the record because I feel it is completely inadequate that the Code of Conduct does not provide any protection to the convener in this regard. And to advise the committee that I will be writing to the Standards Committee to advise them of my concerns in that respect. And with that, I will move on to the next agenda item, which is Agenda Item 1 consideration of continued petitions, the first uh, of which is PE1319 by William Smith and Scott Robertson on improving youth football in Scotland. Members have a note from the clerks and the submissions, and I welcome Chick Brodie to the meeting, uh, who has shown an ongoing interest in this petition. Chick, do you want to make any comments before If I'm making me, thank you very much for allowing me to attend and to uh, speak. Before I, I, I do so, may I, I've just seen the letter from the SPFL. And if I may, with your indulgence, just comment uh, briefly on that. It, the answer reflects an answer that I received to a letter I also wrote to the SFA and SPFL about the <coughs> transfer and the payment of one individual, though we have uh, several others. Uh, it, it, I quote in, in the middle of paragraph two, they say that we are often told of these payments, but to date we have been provided with no evidence and it therefore is of great concern to us that there is continuing allegation and innuendo without any actual substantiation. Uh, I wrote to them highlighting the name of the individual, which of course I will not mention here, in the transfer between two Scotland senior clubs uh, for a sum we believe in the region of £40,000, £8,000 of which went to an agent. Uh, the bodies SFA and SPFL said they were not aware of that 
and yet, lo and behold, on the front page of the website of the agent, they declare that they had registered uh, the individual for whom we sought uh, information. So uh, we will go back to them and we will highlight not just the one, but uh, the, the others that we have. But I think it's really it's stretching it a bit far to say that uh, they've been provided with, with uh, no evidence. Uh, and I think when the agent has declared that the it publicly has declared that they have registered uh, an individual uh, and to have to question the registration competence of the body's concern. May I say, in saying I'm delighted to speak, before I, I really go into, into some substance, I, I will be brief. There are two real tests, I think, to this petition, which I was happy to speak to before and, and happy to be involved with those that brought the petition to us. One, and the, and the most important aspect, uh, as reflected in the Children's Commissioner's report, is the expectation, the expectation and the potential exploitation of, of children, some as, uh, I'm told, uh, as young as six years old. The Children's Commissioner report, I think, reports are invaluable to uh, th you open the, uh, or show a, win uh, a window on, on what he believes is necessary and what he thinks has been happening. The second is the outcome for and the performance of Scottish football generally. Uh, it is not good. Uh, failure at uh, an international level, world level, European level, uh, are evidence-based as to what the national performance is. It's far too centralised, uh, too short-term looking at the future, and skewed towards larger clubs. That does not help, as I see, the expectation of young people who are brought into that environment. Uh, we, I believe, needs a major overhaul, major reorganisation, with stronger emphasis on Scottish youth, and I reflect Scottish youth. We need only, in my opinion, one national organisation that can do that. I, I have to ask what, uh, which of the two organisations is truly fit for purpose with regard to the creation of a youth and elite academy that reflects the size of the Scottish population and doesn't try to emulate, uh, as we've heard before, a, a, proportion, a disproportionate level of, of elite academy related to a uh, population as we have uh, trying to uh, almost have equivalence with that of Germany. The overhaul in terms of, of young people's football, in terms of the role of agents uh, and qualification of them, uh, particularly with regard to children, and of course there is an emphasis on the role of parents, and there should be clear guidelines and penalties on the role of agents, and indeed uh, consideration the role of parents in, in how uh, uh, they, some might be seduced into being persuaded to sign their children up to uh, uh, professional football clubs. And there's a wider role of clubs, I believe, into social and other local sports and community activities. And, of course, the last thing, importantly, is to ensure that in no way is there a default on the education of children who are involved, uh, boys and girls who are involved, uh, in trying to fulfil the expectation of being professional uh, good professional footballers, in some places, great professional footballers. And this can only be done, I believe, if we return uh, football meaningfully to schools, uh, to communities, uh, to boys and girls club uh, at the grassroots, and that to ensure that we begin again to uh, f believe that football, yes, it should be competitive, but it should be fun for children. They are not for sale. Uh, and on that basis, I'm more than happy to talk to you. And again, I... I uh, applaud the petitioners for bringing it forward and I'm happy to, to support the petition and we ask that the committee uh, consider that the appropriate action uh, be taken uh, within the Parliament. I've spoken to the Sports Minister several times about this but uh, I believe it, the time for action is now. Thank well, you. Thanks very much, Chuck, for an interesting contribution. Do members have any comments to make on Angus? <coughs> thanks, Convener. Um, uh, clearly, uh, Thanks to the, the petitioner, the, the SFA, SPFL, uh, have taken the issues uh, concerning youth football uh, reasonably seriously, and, and the petitioner himself has stated uh, that the petition is moving the clubs and governing bodies in the, the right direction. Uh, we've also seen uh, the Commissioner for Children and Young People state that it's clear that there have been some improvements in the approach taken to children involved in youth football. 
However, there, there are still matters at standing, uh, and I also note the Commissioner's comment that he no longer believes the matters which remain outstanding can be dealt with by self-regulation, and he recommends that this committee uh, refers the matter to the Scottish Government to consider how the issues may be dealt with through external regulation, uh, a suggestion which has also been backed by the petitioner. So, in, in light of these responses and uh, taking on board uh, Chick Brodie's comments this, this morning, um, I would suggest the committee should be minded to, to close the petition, but in doing so, a uh, write to the Scottish Government asking for it to look at regulation through legislation to prohibit controls over young people that would not be permissible in any other walk of life, uh, as the petitioner has already put it. Okay, thanks, Angus. John, do you want to make a yes, contribution? Yeah, thank you. Uh, unlike my colleague Angus MacDonald, I don't think we should be closing this petition down. I think we should be, as Angus MacDonald has suggested, writing to the Scottish Government to seek their views regarding the regulation, because clearly uh, the Commissioner uh, for Young People has uh, indicated there are concerns, and having sat through and listened to some of the evidence from uh, the Scottish FA and SPFL, then clearly they don't seem to be taking the issue, as far as I'm concerned, as seriously as the general public and the petitioners. And I think it's only by, by right now that we write to the Scottish Government seeking their views on it, but we include that as part of our legacy uh, for the next committee, because I think there are still issues that need to be addressed here. And by writing to the Scottish Government, hopefully the next committee, uh, the successor committee, will get some response and some idea from the Scottish Government about what action they are going to take. Because Unfortunately, too often we hear about self-regulation not being regulation at all. Uh, and if organisations like the SFA and SPFL are not prepared to regulate or accept and acknowledge there are some issues out there in relation to youth football, then we need to look at some form of regulation that encaptures and protects young people and their families from what could be seen as abuse from unscrupulous agents or clubs. Okay, yeah, I'm minded to argue that you keep this uh, petition open as well and put it into our legacy paper. Um, I mean, the SFA and SPFL are you know, entities in their own right, and like any other commercial organisation, they do uh, have the right to make rules um, to govern themselves. But equally, they take public money. Uh, and recently, they've uh, asked the Scottish Government to contribute to initiatives that they have been pursuing um, and, and I don't think they can have it both ways, they can't on the one hand uh, you know, make the argument that they are a, a, a cultural uh, of such cultural importance and sport importance that the, the Scottish Government has got a responsibility towards them but then say that they don't have any responsibility to act in a way that, um, that those who represent the, the general public would consider to be appropriate. Um, I, I don't think that they've been pushing hard against having a discussion around this. I, mean, I think they have indicated that they'd be prepared to, to sit down in, in some sort of uh, round table uh, discussion. And it could be that we could suggest to the Public Petitions Committee in the next session uh, that they could pursue such a round table uh, and see whether any discussions that could be uh, had in a constructive manner could lead to, to some uh, you know, consensus being achieved as, as to how that could go forward. John? Convener, just to, Mr Brodie will be able to testify to this, uh, the first attempt to get the SFA and SPFL to a committee meeting of the Public Petitions Committee, they resisted uh, and they felt they were not accountable to the Scottish Parliament uh, for their actions. Uh, so the reality is, while I agree, it might be useful to re-invite them to a future committee meeting, but can I say that uh, advised any future committee to look back at the re initial responses from both the SFA and SPFL in relation to the original invitation. It, it took some persuasion, I think is the best way to describe it, to get those two bodies sitting in a committee meeting uh, to discuss and answer some of the issues that were being raised by the petitioners. So it's just to make you aware of that, that they have given evidence in the past, but reluctantly gave evidence. I too had meetings at Hamden Park with the SFA and SPFL, and there are some uh, uh, things happening in Scottish football which are encouraging me. The fans' involvement in the role of Hibs and Hearts, for example, 
in, in widening the, the, if you like, the involvement in the franchise uh, are encouraging, but that's at the senior level. The, the meeting at Hamden, uh, again, you know, reiterated the need for evidence base, which you know, I, I think has been produced, but a round table and certainly a continuation of the petition with that information and with the involvement. I mean, I've had parents who've come to me with uh, problems that they were having with the major clubs uh, in Scotland and the impact it was having on children's education and, if you like, the binding contract. And I'll say, put, make contract a sort of you know, put in inverted commas in terms of how uh, the, 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 the parents have signed up children to be involved and tied very much to a uh, one specific club, uh, and hence the issue that we raised, we raised with transfer fees. So, uh, I would be encouraged if you, if the petition were to carry on as a legacy, as part of your legacy paper, uh, and that uh, around the table, and certainly with more evidence than we had the first time, uh, and perhaps you know bringing parents who would be willing to uh, comment on what has actually happened in, in their experience. Yeah, I think it would be for the, the next committee to, to determine how to do it, but I think we can certainly suggest that, that, that they consider such a, an action if we think, keep it in the, the petition uh, open. Um, but I take on board John's request also to write to the government and get a response in relation to that specific point, and I think we could do both. Members agreed? Angus, you want to know? Just to say, it's a general consensus uh, of the members is to, to keep the petition open <coughs> and to include it in the legacy paper, then um, I'm uh, content with that, um, so long as uh, uh, John Wilson's suggestion about writing to the Scottish Government is included. But with regard to the uh, a further evidence session, I mean, clearly we've, we've tried that in the past. However, uh, Chick Brodie's suggestion that parents should be part of that round table is, is certainly a, a, a good one. If, uh, if we're going to go down that route, because you know it's, it's good to hear straight from the horse's mouth, as it were. Yep, Jackson. Um, I will reluctantly concur with the consensus to keep the petition open. I feel this has been ongoing since 2010. I'm not sure that we're going to make any significant further progress as a committee at all, is my own view. Um, but I note what the Commissioner says, which is summed up in John Wilson's recommendation that we do ask the Scottish Government whether they have any will to intervene. Um, but it would be on that basis that... Uh, okay. I agree. I think that, that point is fair enough. Um, but I think, I think there is a consensus that we try and keep it open and try and pursue it a bit further. Okay. Thanks very much, Chuck, for your contribution. Uh, allow me to speak, please, Thank you. Okay. Our next petition this morning is PE1412 by Bella McDowell on bonds of occasion. Uh, members have a note from the clerk and submissions in relation to this. So I'll open up to the committee to suggest what we do, if there's anything at all. I don't see any indication that there are any suggestions that we can bring forward, David. Convener, I'm quite happy to close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders. Okay, I think that's agreed. Our next petition, PE1477 by Jamie Ray on behalf of Throat Cancer Foundation on a gender-neutral HPV vaccination. Again, I'll invite contributions. Angus again, and then... Convener, um, I note the petitioner's request for the JCVI to accelerate its assessment uh, so that a decision on vaccinating adolescent boys is made this year and not in 2017. However, I also note um, the JCVI's comments that it would be inadvisable to take shortcuts which could undermine the validity of the results in order to expedite the, the review. So while I can understand the petitioner's frustration at the length of time this is taking, uh, I think we should take on board the comments from the GCVI. Um, that said, convener, I think we should write to the Scottish Government, as suggested by the petitioner, to, to ask that it considers early adoption of the programme uh, and to keep this petition open uh, as part of the legacy paper uh, when we await the response from the Scottish Government. Jackson? I would have been minded to recommend we close the petition <laughs> on the basis that the objectives <coughs> actually set out in the original request have been agreed to by the JCVI and that they will be making recommendations which fulfil the request of the petition. Therefore, I'm not sure what further more the committee can achieve. Um, I think we could wait until we get the response from the, the, the Scottish Government. But yeah, I, I, I take your point, Jax. I mean, there isn't much left to do, but there is still a response due back from the government if we write to them. And I think we could wait to see what that response is, notwithstanding the fact that I think some progress has been made in terms of the JCVI. 
Thank you. Yeah, Congress, um, and I would be minded to close the petition myself, but uh, I'm taking on board the petitioner's uh, comments, and I think we should make, take it that wee bit extra. One more letter, I can't do any harm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we agreed that we, we write and just keep it open for that agreed. response to come back. Okay. Uh, next petition, PE 1493, by Peter John Gordon on a Sunshine Act for Scotland. Members think about actions on this one. Stunned silence. <laughs> Jackson. Close the petition under Rule 15.7 on the basis that the Scottish Government has undertaken to review the need for updated guidance on what the petition calls for and is consulting on the issue to gather views. So again, we have fulfilled the objectives originally set out think by the petitioner. Yeah, I, I it's I not for us to do it, it's no, for exactly us to urge the Government I, I can't who've think said of that they will. Else we need to do. Yeah. The members agree? I'm happy to support yeah. Jackson Thank you. So we'll close that petition. Our next petition is PE1517 by Elaine Holmes and Olive McElroy on behalf of the Scottish Mesh Survivors. Here our voice campaign on mesh medical devices. John Scott has joined us this morning. John, you've been pursuing this uh, with some diligence. Uh, do you want to make some comments before we consider the petition? Just to say that uh, I'm very grateful um, for the Petitions Committee having um, carried out the work that they have. I'm very grateful for the letter uh, that has now been received from uh, Cabinet Secretary Shona Robinson in this regard. Um, I think the committee has taken this very serious matter uh, forward uh, in a, a very uh, thoughtful and, and sensitive way, and I'm delighted that it's done so. I note from your paper that you believe that this uh, petition should be extended uh, into the next session of Parliament. Um, that is a view that I would share, um, if that is indeed the view of your other committee members, but uh, I think uh, on behalf of the many affected petitioners, I, I, would take, I would congratulate you on your efforts thus far, but keep up the good work, keep watching, because I don't think all the problems have yet been solved. I'm very aware of recent reports in the press of huge claims having um, now been paid out in America um, with regard to injuries um, suffered as a result of these mesh implants. Um, I can only see that that is likely to lead to more litigation here in this country uh, and therefore in terms of avoiding that in future, I think we have to be vigilant in, our, in how we look to dealing with this problem in future. Okay, thanks very much, John. Jackson. Uh, convener, this is clearly a petition that we should keep open and include in our legacy paper, but I note two specific points within the Cabinet Secretary's letter. One, that we will be seeing a copy of the report on the single incision mini slings, but I think more urgently um, the uh, de facto determination that uh, the regulation of medical devices is reserved to Westminster and that our concern about the uh, conduct and uh, interrogation of these devices by the MHRA uh, cannot be addressed by our uh, looking to the Scottish Government to set up any parallel or, oper or operation. Mm -hmm. I think therefore it will be useful for the committee to write to the UK Government Minister who is responsible for the MHRA, uh, drawing their attention to the work that this committee has done on this subject and asking how we can influence the debate that is taking place over whether or not these devices are being properly regulated by the MHRA, uh, over which we have such significant concern. Okay. I think most people would agree that there's certainly more information appearing all the time about this. We're learning more and horrendous uh, information about the impact of these implants. I think there's a, a good bit of work still to be done on this petition and in general terms about the, the whole um, issue that's been raised. So. I think there is a consensus on the committee that we keep this one open and allow the, the petitions committee uh, in the next session to continue to scrutinise this. Okay, everyone has agreed. Thanks very much again, John. Thank you very much, convener, for allowing me to speak. No problem. Our next petition is PE1548 by Beth Morrison on national guidance on restraint and uh, seclusion in schools. Um, I think there's some work we still need to do on this, and I think writing to the the Scotland's Children and Young People's Commissioner inviting his views on the proposed guidance in the context of this petition 
and to include the petition in our uh, legacy paper for the session five would be advisable. Members agree? Agreed. Okay. Uh, petition PE1563 by Doreen Goldie on behalf of Avonbridge and Stanburn Community Councils on sewage sludge spreading. Angus. Thanks, um, convener. Um, obviously, declare an interest as I've had a constituency interest in this this issue. Um, as we can see from the petitioner's submission, they have broadly welcomed and agree uh, most of the recommendations that have come out of the, the Scottish government's sludge review. However, saying that, um, uh, it has to be not it is noted that the petitioners are disappointed that there's no planned reduction in the spreading of uh, sewage sludge. Uh, in the near future. Um, but saying that, though, I think the petition has achieved a, a great deal. Um, it's brought forward the review. In fact, you could argue the review might not be happening uh, had it not been for the, the petition. Um, and in addition, uh, following uh, pressure from myself and Margaret Mitchell, MSP, and I know that John Wilson has also had an interest in the matter, uh, a large number of the, the points raised have been taken on board uh, by the Scottish Government. So, um, coupled with the, the new legislation on the way uh, and the, 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 the knock-on consultation that that will generate uh, and the fact that the, the petitioners now have uh, direct access to the lead Scottish Government officials, um, which again is a, a welcome development, um, I would normally have been minded to, to close the petition because it's a, a success story for the petitioners and for the petitions committee. However, um, despite welcoming the progress, I think the committee should keep the petition open uh, to allow us to keep a watching brief on any progress uh, that's made uh, with the introduction of legislation and also with regard to the issues uh, that have been raised on um, uh, giving SEPA more more power to, to control the, the, the issue. So um, I think uh, that there's, there's a strong argument to keep the petition open, convener, and hopefully um, other members of the committee are similarly minded. John and then Jackson. Thank you, convener. Like Angus MacDonald, I think we should be keeping this petition open. I think we have achieved a lot and there's been uh, useful progress made. However, the petitioners have raised a number of questions on the submission on the 1st of March in response to the Scottish Government's action to date. Uh, and I think when uh, we're continuing this petition, it would be useful to write to the Scottish Government with the questions raised in the latest submission to find out whether or not those questions can be answered or dealt with as part of the review process uh, to ensure that we don't just have uh, a review in place and guidance issued, but we have the questions that have been asked, by the, particularly by the petitioners, answered at the same time, because there's no point in the government coming out with a review document and saying this is what we're going to do, and some of the questions that have been raised by the Community Council are still, out, still outstanding. Uh, so it would be useful to write to the Scottish Government to say there have been further questions asked, can we get clarification on those issues and ensure that they will be covered as part of any guidance that's going to be issued, particularly the issue about SEPA's powers, uh, because as we've discussed in this committee before, uh, it's okay to say that an agency has powers, but if the agency doesn't have the resources to carry out these powers, then the powers effectively are meaningless. Jackson, then back to Angus. Um, I would have been minded to advocate that we close the petition. It was a petition which called upon the Scottish Government to ban the use of sewage sludge. The Scottish Government has made it clear that it supports the practice of spreading raw sewage. I don't know if that's a more general metaphor, but in any event, um, they have declined to support the aims of the petition. Uh, I hear what my two colleagues say, and if they believe that that would allow us to pursue the petition into the next session, then I'm minded to support that. But it's pretty clear that the actual objective of the petition is not going to be agreed to by the Scottish Government. Yeah. I think we've been in that position before. We accept that the government is not going to do what the petition asked for, but that doesn't mean there isn't an area of work that the, the committee could continue to scrutinise and, and ask questions around and, and hopefully get uh, some answers in terms of the, the ongoing review. But Angus, yeah, thanks. Um, as I understand it, the petitioners have submitted um, their own uh, uh, response direct to the Scottish government. 
Um, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, they, they now have this direct access to the lead officials, which uh, I'm sure is welcomed by everybody. Um, however, there's no harm in the committee uh, submitting the questions that they've raised as well, so that we get some feedback direct from the Scottish Government as well. Uh, I think that's a, a good suggestion. I'd be happy to keep it open just so we get that response back. And at that point, the, the Session 5 committee can de determine whether there's any value in taking it uh, beyond that. Okay, I think we've got agreement on that. Okay, PE1577 by Rachel Wallace on adult cerebral palsy services. Um, I think we still haven't pursued this to the, the fullest extent and there's a bit of work to be done. I don't think there's anything we can do specifically at the moment, but we can't close the petition. I think this is, this is one that has to be left open. Jackson, you... The meeting uh, between uh, Myrtle Fraser, Ms Wallace and the Minister was delayed until the beginning of March means that some of the work streams arising from that haven't had a chance to mature. So I think it would make sense to allow them to progress and for us to consider it, or for the new, for the committee to consider it in the next session. Okay. Well, everyone's agreed on that point. Okay. Petition PE1581 by Duncan Wright on saving Scotland's school libraries. Um, what do members think? Jackson. Very depressed by the uh, response that we've received. Um, I have to say it almost, to my mind, validates the need for the petition because essentially what many of the councils have said, and I think it's summed up very nicely here by Glasgow, school libraries are run in different ways across the country and given the financial challenges that councils are facing, this is an area where reforms have taken place, which essentially means closing libraries down or merging them or undermining and reducing facility. Um, and most of the local authorities that have responded have more or less said, hands off, this is our territory, and as far as I can see, are undermining things. Now, last week we had, what was it, National Good Reader, whatever it was, and I saw the First Minister appearing with Harry Potter and sundry other characters, all reading books and encouraging children to read. Well, that's not going to be possible if there's no libraries for them to go and borrow books from, or educated and trained librarians who are in a position to actually advise and assist them in that job. So... For, to my mind, there is a need for us to pursue this, not just now with local authorities, but with the government, because I don't see how that strategy can be fulfilled uh, with the current way in which libraries, to my mind, and schools are being undermined. Okay. John, did you want to comment? No, sorry. I thought John was, was wanting to go in. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think the, the petition was brought forward based on the ongoing situation, but there was also comment made by a number of people about the concerns about what would happen in this spending round with the, the budget uh, restrictions that local authorities were going to face and I think people thought that a bad situation was going to get worse it would appear that that is exactly what's happening and I just don't think we can uh, walk away from the table by uh, shrugging our shoulders and wringing our hands I think we have to uh, continue to press this issue so I think we have to keep this one open and let the future petitions committee continue to look into this issue um, based on what's coming out of the current um, cuts uh, at local authority level. The members agree? Okay. Our next petition is PE1595 by Alexander Taylor on a moratorium on shared space schemes. Members agree? I just don't think there's, uh, that we've concluded our deliberations on this one. I think there's a, a lot of information that we're gathering in uh, in relation to this petition. I'm certainly learning a lot about the, the concerns around it, and I think there's more that we can learn, um, and we can't close this petition until we've pursued this a lot further. Jackson? I agree, Convener, and again, I was very disappointed by the quality of the response that we received and the variability of it. I mean, one council responded saying, however, due to acknowledged conflicting disability needs and preferences, particularly surrounding care abuse, it is not possible to deliver a street design to meet the specific desires of all disability groups. Um, well, I mean, I just thought, well, that doesn't really take matters very much further forward. Uh, and uh, given that what, the, what was being represented to us is that the street schemes that were being introduced were actually more prejudicial to disability groups than they were before they became shared schemes, um, I, I, I do feel that this is uh, an area where there is a need for further action. I also note the comment by Lord Holmes that the UK government has asked for all UK authorities to submit details of any shared space schemes that they currently operate in order that a review can be undertaken. And I do think that if the UK government is pressing a review of the way in which these are functioning, there may be a case for a parallel initiative here in Scotland. Yeah, I would agree with that. 
with that. I would make one comment, though, in terms of some of the submissions that we've had. There appears to be a belief uh, or a misconception that, that this committee has got the authority to order local authorities not to do these things. And I just think we have to put on record we do not have that authority. But what we can do is scrutinise what's happening and, and ask for a uh, policy direction um, to be looked at. But we cannot uh, make a ruling in terms of the... Uh, the ability of any local authority to uh, implement such a scheme or otherwise, and we certainly cannot order a planning authority to undo any decision that it may have made. John? Where that uh, perception may arise from the Eastern Barnshire's submission, where they describe this committee as a Scottish Government Public Petitions Committee, if, if only convener. Uh, the, we are the Scottish Parliament's Public Petition Committee, and we don't have uh, legislative powers to force the government. I just to think do we have to make that clear in case people are working under a misapprehension. Okay. But we'll definitely keep that petition open and, and take it further forward. Okay. Our next petition, PE1596 by Paul Anderson, James McDermott and Chris Daly on the In Care Survivor Service Scotland. Um, given the ongoing discussions that we're aware are taking place, I don't think we can close this petition. Um, we, we have to leave this in our legacy paper. Members agree? And our next petition is PE1597 by Bill Welsh on mycoplasma fermentans in regressive autism. Um, I, I, Jackson, I'm I think we're up, require, I think we really have to close this petition when the Scottish Government, which acts upon the advice it received, has made it clear it doesn't support the aims of the petition, and therefore I think it uh, impossible that it can proceed. Okay. Um, members agreed that, that that's the case? Agreed. Okay. Um, that brings us then to our agenda item two, the annual report. That's consideration of the committee's draft annual report for the parliamentary year, 11th of May 2015 to the 23rd of March 2016. All committee annual reports follow a standard format as agreed by the conveners group. Members have a note by the clerk and the annual draft report. Do members have any comments on it? It's a pretty standard document. Yeah. Everyone happy to agree the report then? Okay, that's agreed. And as agreed at our last meeting, the committee will now go into private session for the item three on today's agenda. <laughs>